So uh, I want to pick back up where we've been studying. I'll just get for a few minutes. So last week we were talking about um, worship, we were talking about cor corporate worship. We weren't so much in the notes, but the importance of, of, of corporate worship. And uh, we worship God on different levels. We worship Him uh, continually. Continually, uh, the Word of God commands us to do that. I think as we grow in the Spirit of God, that we learn to do that in our life, that we thank Him. You know, we thank Him for whatever the outcomes. Brother Justin was saying tonight, you know, we don't always know what, when we pray, how God is going to answer our prayer. Maybe different than what our ideas are. Does it mean that we've failed in faith and that we, uh, we've not honored God by asking? No, we've asked God, but sometimes we, uh, as believers, have to just trust in, in a God who is so divine that He orchestrates all things well. That He knows how to answer better than what we can project that we need. And so allowing God to be God. And, uh, and, and so uh, we learn to thank Him for the answers. Whatever the outcomes are, we thank Him for that, knowing that He's working in that. And uh, we, we build our worship as we are corporately worshiping together. Remember last week we talked about how the uh, a log it burns brighter and warmer when it is kept in with other logs. I, I guess I'm calling it all a bunch of, of logs tonight. I don't know. I don't mean to. Uh, uh, but, but as we are all collectively together and the fire of the Holy Ghost is working, we will definitely burn brighter and, and, and warmer if we allow God to uh, have his way and we come together collectively. And uh, we need to cultivate places of worship. Have you thought about that since last week? You know, are we cultivating places of worship where maybe we can, instead of doing things that would occupy our time or take our time, but we choose to not do those things, but we uh, rather uh, choose to worship God, spend time together. Whether it's uh, a telephone call, a text, uh, uh, a computer, a television, whatever it is, you know, putting that aside and saying, wait a second, I'm going to schedule time for perpetual worship for God. And we talked about that. Is it appointed or is it perpetual worship? Well, we should be in a place of perpetual worship uh, uh, with God. But because uh, when Adam and Eve were in the Garden of, of, of Eden, it was perpetual worship. They worshiped God continually. They were clothed with the Spirit of God. Amen. They were there obeying God. God walked with them. God talked with them. Uh, it was a life of perpetual worship. When mankind fell, that perpetual worship became an appointment of worship. And so uh, folks would come to the tabernacle. They would offer sacrifices. They would uh, do uh, their, their time of worship. But it would be by an appointment. Even though there was perpetual worship going on at the tabernacle, priests were work, working and, and perpetual worship was going But to the worshiper alone that wasn't a priest, it was an appointment of worship. And so when Jesus Christ came, uh, God's design was always to get us back to perpetual worship, uh, not to be at an appointment. And so when Jesus Christ came, He made us priests. He saved us, and now we are a royal priesthood. We have appointments of worship, yes. We come to church three times a week, and you have those times in your life that are scheduled that you worship and you're with God, and so they're appointed, but it's getting us back to that place of perpetual worship where we worship God continually. Amen. Because of the cross, Christ has done that for us. Amen. We are now priests, and uh, we, we are taking back by the cross what the enemy stole through deception and deceit in the Garden of Eden. Amen. God bring us back to a place of perpetual worship. And then one day, amen, when we uh, when we, we, we go to sleep in the faith, amen, but we're transformed from this world to the next, amen, there's going to be a place of perpetual worship around about the throne. 
can you imagine as the, uh, 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 as, uh, as the beach, the elders, uh, angelic worship, saints of all ages and, 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 and from all time spans, they are worshiping around the throne of grace. Amen. There's not a, a, a night, amen, but it is a continual day, Sister Doc, and there is worship round about the throne of God. Amen. So we're practicing for when we get to heaven. Amen. Worship around the throne. Amen. Where we'll fall and worship to Him. Amen. Where we'll cast our crowns before Him. Where we'll shout to Him. Uh, holy, holy. Where we'll sing a new song. Amen. Worship. Amen. It's a great thing. That's why it needs to be a part of our life now. Amen. Worship. Amen. So God, uh, He provided everything uh, for Adam and Eve. And uh, their response should have been gratitude and reverence and honor and submission. Amen. As, as, as they were in, in, in a holy place, God's still working to bring us back. He did that through Jesus Christ. Amen. It's appointed, but it is perpetual. Amen. Let's find a place of worship. Last week, I finished off by the, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, sentence. And I don't know where it is on your page because my page is lined a little bit different. Like, amen. How, uh, but it's on my second page toward the bottom. How can God bless us when we are so critical of others? Let's be careful that we don't become so self-righteous that we think God made us to be little gods to point the finger and snub our nose to others who are honestly striving to do what is right. Would someone read there in Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4, 29 through 32, and then I'll make a few comments. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Amen. Let me give you those words real quick. The words are, let no corrupt, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Put away from you Put away from you. And be kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I like what Paul is writing to the Ephesians. He said not to let any corrupt, uh, any corrupt communication proceed out of our mouth, but that which is good in ministering grace to the hearers. So when we talk, whether it's to believers or to unbelievers, the Word of God says that our words should be flavored, seasoned with grace. If we were to take that and to say <coughs> in modern terminology that our talking should be a blessing. Amen. That when we talk, uh, whether it's, you know, the things of God, whether it's just our general conversation, engaging <coughs> with others, that really our conversation should be a blessing. Amen. You know, I know that sometimes, you know, we can get, and get involved in deep conversations with people, and uh, we want to make sure that when we're done, that our, our, our conversation has been full of worship, <coughs> that it has been grace and a blessing to others. So I want to read, uh, if you would, 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32. Actually, let me, let me uh, read that phrase there for, beforehand. Just remember, it's easy to be the one doing the criticizing, but it's not fun at all to be the one who is being criticized. So I want to read 1 Corinthians 11, 31, 32. <coughs> Amen. We're chasing, we're chasing of the Lord. 
How many of you have ever just taken time to really just judge yourself? Not according to the standards of anyone else, not according to what someone may think about you, but according to the Word of God and what God's standards are. It's being that judge. We're, we're talking in our notes about how can we worship God, but yet we criticize others. Criticize other believers, criticize other people, but we're mostly looking at criticizing other believers. Now let's talk for a minute about something. Do you know no church will be the same? Uh, you can't go to any church and you can't make it the same because it's full of different people. Now there are several things that when we look at that, we can automatically say, well, there's different people. They come from different walks of life. They've had different life experience. All that is true, but also we have to look at this. We can't make any type of, uh, of judgment or criticism of the church because we don't know the spiritual level of people in that church. Some churches may be full of people that are seasoned with years and years of a walk with Christ. Where other churches may be more uh, 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 numbered by those which are believers that are relatively new to the faith. And their maturity and the things of God hasn't been on the meat of God's word for as long as other churches and other people. They've been on the milk of God's word. We don't know what God is doing in the life of others. I realize that God is still working in our lives. No matter where we are, God is still working. We talk to people that's been saved for many, many years, whether they're old in the faith or whether they're old physically, we find that God is still working in their life. So who, who are we to judge them? Amen. We need to be judging ourselves by the standard of God's Word. And if we are worshiping, we have no ability to be able to judge one another. Whether you know, if we're judging one another, then we're not being a blessing one to another if we're criticizing. Sister Dot, if I'm not giving you the words of grace and season with grace, but I come to you with criticism, I'm not worshiping. I need to get to a place of being a blessing. Does that mean that we never confront folks? I think there's a time and there's a place for that. But, but not all the time. People are not gifted to be the one to, to, to point out the wrong in everybody. Amen. Uh, if God wants us to judge ourselves. And when we judge ourselves, we allow ourselves to be chasing the God. Amen. So worship involves words that are seasoned with grace, even in our conversation with one another. Worship is looking at our life and making sure it measured up, measures up with the meat and the standard of God's word. You know, there's a, there's a real privilege in the Word of God said, we've just read that in Ephesians, that we should be kind and tenderhearted to one another. That means that we should be concerned for one another, that we should be prayerful for one another, that we should be in a place of edification of one another because we're tenderhearted and we're kind because we know that God has forgiven us for Christ's sake. Christ rallied around for us on the cross. Amen. What he was doing is he was purchasing our salvation on the cross. That God, the God the Father, would forgive us of our sins. And we should do the same thing for others. Be tenderhearted. Even as Christ was tenderhearted toward us. Amen. Let's read the next uh, verb, uh, 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 sentence. Uh, some people think that it is a gift that it is a gift of the Spirit to be able to tell you what is wrong with others. It's, it's not always the Holy Spirit, but the unholy Spirit, Satan. Of whose spirit are you? Someone read Romans 14, verse 10 through 13. Judge this rather that no man place, stumbling blocks, or 
occasion to fall in his mother's way. Amen. So the words were stand. Amen. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Amen. We're all going to be judged by Christ. Bottom line. So that every one of us will give account. Give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man shall put a stumbling block. And I'm going to stop there because Brother Justin's already read it. Amen. So we're back to where Brother Graham has preached uh, that Tuesday evening. Every one of us is going to give an account for our lives before God. Every one of us. So you know what you did today, what I did today? Every one of us is going to be accountable for these 24 hours that God has given us. Amen. We're going to be responsible to God. We're going to be responsible for how that we, we've conducted ourselves. We're going to be responsible for our conversation and our treatment with others. We're going to give account to that. And so when we think about that, amen, that as, as we are going to give account, every one of us will someday, amen, whether saved or unsaved, are going to bow our knees, going to confess that He is Lord. And so uh, uh, the writer of Romans says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. Amen. But we need to be mindful that in our life that we don't put a stumbling block in front of someone else. Do you know if you're always going around fault finding, if you're always going around criticizing, and even other believers, it doesn't build up the kingdom of God that's here at Miracle Revival Church. It doesn't build up the body of Christ. No edification to the believer. Amen. And it's not being an example to the world. And so our life should be marked by worship. Uh, worship is not marked by being critical or having a critical spirit, but it is by being a blessing. Amen. And making sure we're numbering our days, knowing that we will give account to God. Amen. Did we take every opportunity that we had to worship God? Amen. If not, we will give account of that before God. You know, when I was younger, boy, 50 years seemed like a long time. It ain't looking so long anymore. It goes by quick. And so, Lord, teach us to number our days. Teach us to be accountable of every moment. How does it start? We live every second, every minute, of every hour of every 24 hours, of every day, of every year, of every day, of every lifetime for God. And that's real worship. We think others are prideful and their expression of worship is wrong because of their pride. When we are the ones that cannot express our worship to the fullest because of our pride and our criticism of others. Take a moment to search, to search your heart. Have you been allowing Satan to use you to tear down, tear down the body of Christ? To accuse, to accuse the brethren? You need to repent. Ask God to forgive you and turn from your wicked ways. We are not pleasing. We are not pleasing to God. We who call ourselves holy need to act holy. We need to be holy. Someone read Psalms 50 verse 19 through 23. Psalms 50, verse number 19 through 23. Thou givest thy mouth evil in thy own presence. Thou saidest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thy own brother's son. These things have thou done. And I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a such a one as thyself. If I will reprove thee, set them in order before thy mouth. I consider this be that. Amen. The 
word is reprove, but I will reprove thee. The next word is forget. He that forget God. The next word is ordereth. Ordereth this conversation. Let me ask you this question. Can a Christian? Can a Christian yield herself as an instrument for Satan to use? Absolutely. Does it mean that we're not saved? Doesn't mean we're not saved. It simply means that we will be accountable. We can get ourselves to a place where we can lose out with God. But you know, sometimes we lack, as the psalmist right here, we forget God. Has anyone ever forgot God in their life? Anyone ever forget God in your conversation? Anyone ever forget God in your schedule? Yes, I would dare say every one of us in here has. And if we're not careful, we can forget God and our conversation can become that that's not worshipful to God, but it can be tearing down of the body of Christ. As the writer here says, that, 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 we, that we sit and speak us against thy brethren, thou slanderest thy own mother's son. Do you know what? We are the body of Christ. You're my brother and you're my sister and it would be like taking your own flesh and blood and you slandering them. What purpose would there be in that? Why would you do that? No purpose. No reason. God doesn't want us to speak ill of our brothers and our sisters. We will be accountable to God. Would we want God to tear us in pieces the way that sometimes maybe we can tear others in pieces? Listen, I've been guilty of it before. Sometimes we can be hurt. Sometimes we can be disappointed. Sometimes we can be dis defensive. And so what do we do? Our verbs, we may not physically attack someone, but we verbally can attack them. We can say things that are not good to tear them down. And so we need to understand that that's not what comes from a worshipful mouth. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And so how can there be sweet and bitter water flowing from the same fountain? There can't be. So we need to ask God to help us to keep sweet water flowing from our mouth. Because, because it becomes a, a matter of the heart. Amen. We can actually hate and kill someone in our heart and never do anything to them physically. But if we've done it in our heart, then we're guilty of doing it the same as what we would do physically. And so we need to ask God to help us. We can't worship and be killing our brother and our sister. So God help us in our worship that we're not critical with our spirit because we can't be critical and worship God at the same time. Does anyone have anything they want to say there? someone has some comments. Let's read that, verse, that sentence there. We need to conduct ourselves we need to conduct ourselves in conversation in a way that honors God and brings glory to God. He commands us to love one another. So in all of our conversation, how is that? Does it exemplify our love for Christ? Someone read 1 John 4, 7, and 8. Fairly simple. You probably know it from the top of your head. The love that lets love one another. The love of God and everyone that loveth is born of God. He that loveth God knoweth not God, for God is love. The love of God's love does for God also should love one another. No, no man has seen God at any time. love one another, God dwelleth in us, and His love is perfected in us. Amen. So no man has seen God at any time. But if we love one another, God dwells in us. 
Amen. I've never seen God with my physical eyes, but I've seen Him in you. Sister Val, I've seen Him in you. And Sister Saints, I've seen Him in you. Well, because we love God. So the Word of God says that if we say that we love God and we love not our brother, the love of God doesn't dwell in us. We say that. We, we, we trick and we deceive ourselves. But we have to love one another. And when we love one another, it exemplifies that the love of God dwells in us. How can we come to church and raise our hands and worship, but we leave here and we don't love someone? Then we really don't have the love of God dwelling in us. So we may need to go back to the drawing board and judge ourselves and allow the Spirit of God to chasten us so that we can be a real worshiper and love God and display the love of God to others. Amen. It's true tonight. Real worship is that. Amen. That's why when we started out talking about worship, it's not just a feel-good feeling. Amen. We can feel good about worship, but then we can walk away and not have the love of God in us. Then we don't love others. Then no one sees God because He doesn't dwell in us. It has to be more than a feel-good. It has to be a relationship. It has to be about God. Then we will be blessed. All right. Let me read the, this next uh, sentence. When we love someone, we are careful how we talk about them. We don't tell all the, all the bad about those that we love. Because people criticize, mock, and scorn, we need to be careful that we don't hold our worship in reserve, in reserve for fear of man's approval. Our ultimate goal should be to please God. To have God's approval. We miss out many times. We miss out on many blessings because of pride. Maybe you have been criticized and it deeply wounded you. Let go forgive. And be what God wants you to be. We are just as bad as our accusers if we don't forgive. Let me just stay here for a few minutes and just talk. How many of you, you know, through the years I've noticed that, uh, you know, there can be people that I, I know, and I may not know well, maybe I just know them because of the affiliation of where I'm at. And I hear them speaking ill of maybe their parents. How can you love your parents and speak ill of them? Or maybe someone who is married speaks ill of their spouse. All of a sudden, there's a real flag that waves to me and says, there's problems there. There's problems when you speak ill of your spouse. Because if you love someone, you really don't speak evil of them. Do you know it's amazing how that love, love just kind of uh, accepts even the bad characteristics of people? You know, when I say bad characteristics, who cares if they smoke and they laugh? Who cares if, you know, you know what, what I, I don't want to go into crazy things. Uh, I can't even think of anything funny I'd like to. That's just not sometimes the way it flows with me. But, you know, we accept a lot of things because we love people. And you know, some of the people that maybe aren't as appealing to the eye, but when you get to know them, they become the most beautiful people. Because you, you, you grow to love them. And when you love people, you don't speak evil of them. You know, if we say we love God, we can't be going around speaking evil of other people. And if we say we love other people the way that God loves us and wants us to treat our brothers, and sisters, then we won't be speaking ill of them. And if you know someone has spoken ill of you, I think I think the Lord helps us in our growth of this. You know, if someone speaks ill of you, so what? Uh, forgive them. We have a responsibility to forgive others. We can hold on to it, and who does it hurt? Us. We can allow it to fester, 
but who does the infection bother and, and, and hurt? Us. So learning to forgive others. Remember I said that sometimes people hold on to things that happened five years ago, a decade ago, a quarter of a century ago, a, se a half a century ago. People can hold on to crazy things. You know, it's funny, you know, uh, I, I don't, when I look at people I went to high school with, you know, I don't really look at them for who they were in high school. Some of them may have had things in high school. Man, that's 20-some years ago. I've changed. I look at my life and I'm not. So why would I hold them to be back there in that place that I'm not at? And so it's allowing people to, to have grace and forgiveness and not to judge them. You know, maybe someone said something. They probably forgot about it. Why don't we? Why don't we? And so it can hold us back in our worship. It can hold us back from praying for others. It can hold us back from worshiping with others. It can hold us back in worshiping ourselves. So we need to let go. Someone read 1 John 5, 2 and 3. Someone read that last verse, Matthew 12, 37. It shows others God in us. 